Hi everyone, welcome. I'm George Cow, Authentic Business Coach, and I wanted to do these free public Q&A calls um, as a special form of support for these strange times that we're living through. So this Q&A call will be where I answer questions any, anywhere from how do we manage our time well in these situations to how do we run Facebook ads to um, you know specific questions about uh, participants businesses so you're gonna get a lot from you know a lot of variety uh, in, in these uh, public Q&A calls and that's a good thing I think you'll it'll keep it interesting uh, and I want to thank those of you who were able to join me live uh, I know a lot of you are watching this later uh, on a replay and we'll welcome you as well and uh, I want to uh, give you an opportunity to introduce yourself uh, in the chat below and uh, or in the comments below the video. So a couple things I'd love for you to, to write below and you could brainstorm this or write this as I continue talking. I know it's a little bit of a multitasking, but uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best here. Um, which is, where are you in the world? I'd love for you to tell us that. And tell us a little bit, a little bit about your business. Uh, maybe a little bit of an, an elevator pitch intro, like you know, who are your ideal clients and what do you love doing for them? Uh, so where you are in the world and a bit about your business and the third question I'd love for you to answer is how are you feeling in these? Surreal times that we're living through where the entire planet, you know billions of people are uh, In a bit of survival mode perhaps uh, or at least you know some people are fearful about what's happening uh, there's, there's a lot to be dismayed about you know both in terms of the health crisis, but also economics, uh, people's livelihoods are at stake. So there's a lot going on, and and there's a lot of uh, blessings in disguise as well. There's there's I believe there's always a gift in every situation. There's a gift, no matter what the disaster may be. There is a gift if we're willing uh, to look for it. So. Um, I also would like, that's the fourth question I have for you. The so first one is, where are you in the world? Second one is, tell us a bit about your business. Third one is, how are you feeling at these times, in these times? And fourth one is, what might you name as a hidden gift or a, a blessing that you, we could name in this kind of situation? So, or maybe a word of encouragement you might have for others who are feeling fear, Dismay, you know, discouragement. What's 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 your word of encouragement? Um, a few words of encouragement for them, and for yourself too. So, I look forward to your comments and your chats below, and uh, and thank you for that. I will be sure to be reading that later because I'm not going to be able to read that in real time. But I want to get to the questions that were submitted in advance, and we'll just we'll just go through them one by one. And uh, if you have those of you who are live here, if you have any. Uh, follow-up questions to what I'm saying you can chat below I put the word question in all caps and then you're you type out the question um, uh, and those of you watching this later you can you know ask follow-up questions below I might not be able to respond in depth uh, in the follow-up uh, in, in the comments but um, uh, at least maybe I can respond with a few words so all right and here we are with the first question is from Elisa uh, which is, uh, give me a second here, and make sure that I am able to, uh, a little bit of technical difficulties here. Give me, give me one moment to, um, okay. So Elisa says, time management related. In these unsettling times, how do you keep up with the schedule and with discipline? <laughs> okay, so I love this question. And by the way, if you have any responses to any of these questions, I welcome you to comment below as well, because I'm not the only one who uh, is dealing with these times. All of us are, right? So how do we how do we deal with this? So I think that, and I've, I've kind of jotted a few a few things here. I think it's okay to give give a day or two to reflect rest and renew you know I, I i had to really do that you know when the reality of the situation um really made an impact on me i you know i, I took a day or two just to say you know what, i'm just taking a break 
I'm taking a break. I'm just going to, you know, from my regular schedule and just going to reflect on what's happening. And like I said, um, how do I respond mindfully to the situation? How do I respond without spiraling into fear and dismay, which is not unusual, right? Lots of people are, are doing that right now. But how do we, as we, ref, as we rest, you know, we, we do some extra rest and reflect on how do we, you know, how do we mindfully respond with wisdom, courage, compassion, and joyful discipline? You know, that, that's the other thing. It's like, this is not a time to uh, give in to the spiraling of the negativity because, and I want to look you in the eyes as I say this, one of the things I've noticed about human beings that are, especially people who are really, really smart, is that the smarter you are, the better your excuses are as well. The better your excuses about not doing the things that you feel are important and of high priority in your life and in your work, whatever that may be. I'm not saying you have to follow my plan or anything, but whatever your high priorities are, that be before this crisis, what were your high priorities in your life and in your work? And then now the crisis hits. It is especially easy for those of us who are smart, everybody here, and the smarter you are, you have PhD or you're just very wise and thoughtful, the better your excuses are going to be to say, well, I'm not going to go with my priorities that were before this crisis hit. So I want you to be really aware of that. Okay. I don't find myself to be a very smart person. I'm smart in certain areas, but overall, I'm just, I think I'm average. So my excuses are not that good. <laughs> I can spot my excuses very quickly. And I say, oh, George, you're making an excuse. Oh, oh. no, there's no excuse here. You're still going to keep your content going. I'm still going to keep my offerings going. Yes. And of course, I'm going to try to give extra compassion to myself and to others but I'm gonna keep my rhythm going. I'm not gonna let any crisis, albeit a once in a lifetime global crisis, I'm just gonna keep going. So that's my attitude for myself. And if you wanna borrow that, great. But I understand the need to re reflect, renew, re re you know, uh, rest a lot, but we need to mindfully respond and go from there. And then here's the thing, we need to go back to a schedule stable a stable schedule as soon as possible because unstable times require stable people the people in your life need you especially to be stable right now and this includes your audience your audience needs you to continue sharing your your expertise and your knowledge and your gifts okay yes of course you can address coronavirus, the fears, the economic you know, downturns. You can address these things in your content and even in your offerings. And we'll talk about that later. But this is not the time to say, I'm just exhausted from all this global stuff and I'm just going to take a month off or two. I don't think a month and two, a two taking off is actually a reality for any of us small business owners, number one. Okay. But number two, Remember, the smarter you are, the better your excuses. So just be really aware of that, okay? So, um, all right. <clears throat> Let's continue on here. Next question is, okay, from Anonymous. And these, these questions were submitted in advance, and some people were okay with mentioning their first name, you know, and some people wanted just to be anonymous, and some people are okay mentioning their full name. So thank you all for submitting your questions, no matter how you feel. <clears throat> so how do you consistently keep writing every day? <laughs> and the answer to that is very simple. I have a stable schedule, even during a global pandemic and economic depression. <laughs> okay, I have a stable schedule. I don't let it affect my schedule. My schedule, you know, it's funny. Um, if, you, if you look at my actual schedule right now, it is the schedule here in, you know, end of March, at the start of an intense pandemic crisis is the same 
as the start of January when we just started hearing about this and we weren't sure what was happening yet, I had the same schedule. Keep writing every day, keep showing up on video. And actually there is one change to my schedule. There's only one change, which is that I am carving out extra time to do free public service. That's it. Only change. And you might want to as well. Keep your same business schedule except adding some public service events. That's it. And you don't have to do it every day. I know some people are doing like, you know, quarantine live streams every single day. I, I, yeah, of course I could do that, but it's, it's, I think it's, um, yeah, I don't think it's necessary personally. And, and it's hard to keep up. And once the quarantine ends, well, gosh, I'm going to not give you the live streams daily anymore. I don't know. It's just a little weird to me. So I think, yes, yeah, I, I'm going to do these public things probably once a month, um, maybe twice a month right now as the things are intense, but that's it, right? Uh, and again, the, if any of you have any thoughts on, on what I'm saying or thoughts on the question, please, you're welcome to comment below, share your opinions. Even your opinions are different than mine. You're, you're very welcome. I'm very open to being challenged. Um, I always have been, I always have enc encouraged my clients to question me, to challenge me, because that's how I become better. That's how our, my services and my products and my, my presence becomes more useful to you all. So I'm growing just like all of us are, you know, so. <clears throat> okay. The next question is from Lou. Thank you, Lou. And Lou says, um, I'm struggling to decide on the most appropriate strategy in this climate. I want to give back and support, but of course I need to make a living as all of us do, right? Small business owners, right? Lots of upcoming work has been canceled. That's so, uh, that's so sad. And I'm looking at developing more online courses, but I'm unsure of the best approach regarding marketing them. There's a big part of me that feels uncomfortable with what may be seen as capitalizing on the current situation. But in reality, I'm trying to keep my head above water. How many of us can relate to this question? I certainly can, right? So <clears throat> here's my thoughts on this. If you can offer something special, if, if there are special offers for, for the vulnerable, I should say, it may be seen as taking advantage of them. And I should say special paid offers, like free offers are very welcome at this time. You know, free, free events, I should say, free events and um, products are very welcome at this time. Um, but, um, <clears throat> sorry, so I'm gonna keep going here. Better if you keep offering what you usually do anyway. Okay, so, so this is, um, excuse me here. I had to sneeze. Don't worry, seasonal allergies, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, I always have al allergies in this time. And what, what a bad timing for allergies, right? Like I'm on the street walking my dog and I sneeze and people are like freaked out even across the street. They're like, stay away from that guy. <laughs> Unfortunately, especially because he looks Chinese, there's a lot of racism at this time, especially for people like me. I do notice that people are taking a wider berth around me when I'm walking these days. I'm out there and I understand people have fears and there's misunderstanding about how this is a Chinese virus. It's not the Chinese virus, but, but <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm, I'm dealing with that too. So, um, so better if you keep offering. So, so the question is what has been your typical offer rhythm? Meaning what has been your typical schedule? of mentioning your paid offerings. And this is, this is a bit of a, a reality check for some of you because some of you are like, I haven't had a schedule <laughs> for, for letting my audience know what my product and services are and that's dangerous because you know, my audience knows I have a stable schedule of offerings. I always have some course of the month. So during this time, I'm gonna keep offering my course of the month you know, with the, if I can layer on top of that, some compassionate response to the situation, I will do so. But I'm not going to stop my 
my stable stable schedule of offerings. Now, if you haven't, if your audience hasn't been, uh, if your audience hasn't been used to your rhythm of what you sell, then they may see what you're doing as a taking advantage, especially if you're saying, hey, pandemic special. Okay, that's a little strange. So what I recommend is if when you do make offerings at this time, don't, if it's not related to the pandemic, don't mention it. It's not a pandemic special. It's not a quarantine special. It's just, hey, I offer creative writing right now for, for those of you who are working on your creative. Just, just that's all you need to say. That's all you got to say. But like I said, you may want to offer additional free public events like I'm doing here. Um, but be <clears throat> mindful that your free things shouldn't be in such an intense rhythm that it's going to be hard for you to keep it up. Because at what point is the pandemic over and you're going to stop offering your free things? I'm offering this once a month. It's very, if I keep offering free things once a month for a while, it's very sustainable for me. And at some point, maybe later in the year, it will, I'll stop offering it and it doesn't seem like a, an abrupt stop. So just be aware of that. I also am really wary of people offering like their time for free. I get it. Maybe you do additional complimentary sessions than you typically already do. Um, but you might want to give a time limit on that to say, Hey, for the next two weeks, I'm going to just give special support and that's okay. So I hope this is helpful. And if you have any other ideas or, or maybe you've seen two questions, have you seen others do it in a not very tasteful way? I'm curious about your thoughts below and alternatively, have you seen it done well? So if you have an example on either one, I'd be really interested just to see. Or if you've done something and it's been received well, please go and comment below. So either your own example or someone else's that you've seen. Okay. And thank you everyone for your chats. I'll be sure to, to review uh, this later. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question is from Pamela. Okay, I'm just gonna go to the next page here. Pamela says, I'm curious on your take. For those of us already operating mostly online, what are the ways we might need to or pivot the needs of our clients now, particularly with regard to the type of offerings and their price point? And possibly how to cut through the noise of now everyone offering online with a clear voice? Yeah. So I think this is similar to the question above. So I think a lot of what I've said applies here, but um, you know, I'll just I'll say a couple more things. Like people, of course, need more community more than ever now. You know, they need more, especially since we can't get together in person. I think online communities are very welcome right now. So group online things, right? Group online, <laughs> online things are especially welcome, right? Um, and people are also getting more used to group online things, right? My, my, I have a tutorial on YouTube for how to do Zoom. And here's an interesting thing. Um, before the pandemic, my Zoom tutorial already had a lot of views, 300,000 views on YouTube. You know? Within three weeks, it now has over 800,000 views. <laughs> so it's going to hit a million views, my Zoom tutorial on YouTube going to hit a million views within a single month um, because people are teach. It's mostly teachers. I, all the comments are, are teachers all, of, all across the world who are now having to teach online. So people are more and more used to gathering online. So please, please, uh, if you've, even if you've offered in-person things in the past, now it's time to get creative and say, how can I offer some group experience, some group teaching or facilitation of their experience online. And so this is a question for you. Please comment below if you would like to. What's your idea? What might you offer as a group experience online, whether it's paid or free? Let's get some ideas going. So go ahead and comment below. I'm just gonna pause for a moment here.
Okay. Yeah. You know, so some examples here. Peers is offering a men's circle on uh, to offer meditation, practice, and sharing. So many of you can do this kind of thing as well for your ideal audience. Right? Um, Amy says, I coach couples, and I had the thought of doing a group session for building your family foundation for parents. Yeah, especially now. Kids are out of school, at home, and family issues are more than ever before. So how can you address that from your own niche. This is actually a real question for all of you. How can you address the fact that many people are now at home with their loved ones or previously loved ones? <laughs> no. Um, you know, how can you address that? Kids are all over them and now they have they have to be with their <laughs> their spouse like 24/7, right? How do you address that? How do you address that from your point of view, from your work? You know? whether it's creative writing or business or relationships or healing or spirituality or fill in the blank. There's something that can be addressed about people being at home and what does that mean then? Mm. Oh yeah. Pamela says the one challenge I have is with offering music circles on because on zoom, it doesn't work. Yeah. Zoom has a latency of like, even if it's half a millisecond can't work for music because music depends on real time rhythm. But I did Google this a little bit, and there is something called Jam, ooh, what is it? Um, Jam Kazam, is it Jam Kazam? Uh, yes, Jam Kazam claims, I haven't tried it, so Pamela, please try it and let us know how it goes. Jam Kazam claims to be able to do online real-time music collaboration. Real-time, I don't know how they do it. They must have some kind of weird, I don't know, but. Check it out. Let us know if it works. There's has been a lot of music teachers who've reached out to me and I'm like, I don't know. Zoom doesn't work. So try this. I haven't tried it. Um, and there might be alternatives to Jam Kazam. If you start Googling around with that keyword, you might find, uh, might find others. So, um, <clears throat> so um, okay. Let's keep going with, uh, with the questions here. All right. Oh, and in regards to cutting through the noise, you know, it really, this actually, this, this question is, this answer is the same as, as, as it has always been, which is no matter if it's, you know, I, I would say this at all times, the online environment is crowded, you know, and, and you might say it, it feels crowded now, but take note of the fact that there's also more, attention online than there ever has been before. So it's kind of like, interestingly, if you think about it this way, it's, it's almost like the attention has grew, like the, the usage on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Twitter has grown, let's say threefold. Okay. Let's say there used to be a, a hundred people looking at Facebook every millisecond. Okay. Maybe now it's 300 people, right? But the offers and the content are not, not that much more. Yes, there might be twice as many content and offers, but there's probably three times as much attention. So ironically, there's probably more opportunity now in terms of online connection than there has been in the past, meaning sharing your message. So the message, the answer is the same as it always has been. How do we cut through the clutter online? Not the clutter, but the, the, the drone, not the drone, but the abundance of other voices you might think as, of as a drone <laughs> when you see things that are like, I can't believe people post this kind of stuff online, but the abundance of other content online, how do we cut through? Same response as ever, having enough reach and the right fit content and offers. Enough of the right people seeing the right content and the right offers with enough trust in you. It's always been like that. So let's talk about these things, right? So enough people, how do you reach enough people? Well, if you've been building an audience, of course, you have more people than you did before, but how do you build an audience? Facebook ads is my favorite way or collaborations is my second favorite way. There's many ways to build an audience. SEO, usually Google SEO usually takes six to 18 months. Yes. 
YouTube SEO is faster. So YouTube SEO can take a, just only a week to 30 days to, to get found by a, a, a quickly searched topic. Even my Zoom tutorial, which is three years old. Okay, my Zoom tutorial is three years old and is already outdated is getting, has doubled its views from 300,000, tripled its views, 300,000 to almost 900, probably by the end of the day, 900,000 views. Three-year-old video. So if the topic is the right fit for an audience, they will find it either on Google or on YouTube. Um, Facebook SEO, not so much, not so good, but Facebook ads is excellent right now. At this time, more people are surfing Facebook than ever, and lots of corporate advertisers are pulling back on Facebook more than ever because corporate profits are down, so less money for advertising. So Facebook ads have been cheaper than they have been in years. I have not seen the prices like this since probably 2015. So if you're thinking of running Facebook ads and testing it, now is a better time than ever before, at least from the past few years. So how do we get enough audience, enough reach? Either ads or collaborations. Collaboration is my favorite way, meaning uh, my second favorite way, which is to connect with other people who already have an audience and do a trade, trade interviews. But of course, somebody who has a much bigger audience than you might not want to do that trade because it doesn't feel fair. But find somebody with a similar sized audience. And I always say 50 to 200% of your audience. So if you have 100 Facebook fans, look for somebody with between 50 to 200 Facebook fans to collaborate. If you have 1,000 Facebook fans, look for someone between 500 and 2,000 fans to collaborate because you all grow together. You trade interviews, trade a Zoom interview. You interview them for your audience. They interview you for their audience. Everybody wins. Their audience gets to meet you. Your audience gets to meet them. And you both grow your audiences together. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. You both learn how to you know, present again. And so I do these interviews as often as I can. So collaborations and Facebook ads, those are my two favorite ways to grow enough reach. So I said enough reach of, of, the, um, of the right people. So the right people is very important. Learning Facebook ads, many people do Facebook ads incorrectly and they don't reach the right people. They build a large audience of the wrong people. That's bad for spending. It's bad for organic reach. It's bad for many reasons. So enough reach, enough of the right people, meaning you've studied your ideal clients enough to know how to reach that kind of person on Facebook ads. Or, in, or with collaborations, you, you know, okay, my ideal clients tend to follow people like this, so I'm going to collaborate with people like that, right? So enough reach of the right people, of the right content, the right offers, the right content, right offers, meaning as you create and post and share content out there, you will have to notice what works for the right people and what doesn't work. Those things will train your intuition to share more of the right things going forward. And the right offers, the same thing, right? You need to test your offers again and again. That's why I, I sell something at least once a month. It's stable. Even during a global crisis, I sell something at least once a month. I need to keep doing this because I need to keep testing. I'm always testing. Hey, is this something interesting for you? Oh, it's not interesting. Or it used to be interesting and not so much anymore, right? Like my Facebook ads course, did really well in 2017, 2018, 2019. For some weird reason, it's doing really poorly in 2020. I think because my audience has all seen it before and they're, they're kind of tired of it. So I'm, not, I'm gonna give it a rest and maybe bring it back in 2022, right? So things may do really well sometimes and you need to give it a rest and then it'll do really well again. So you have to keep testing your offers. To test your offers, you present something at least once a month. Some of you need to present something once every two months or once every uh, two weeks right now because you're still testing to see what people want to buy from you. Test your offers. Very, very important. And finally, I said enough trust. Well, enough trust comes from um, uh, content, but also comes from your one-to-one -one connections with your audience, commenting. You know, Pamela, I want to call you out for being such a thoughtful commenter. Right. She, she, whenever I see her comments, it's like amazing. So thoughtful comments on your fans posts, um, on, on other people on, you know, Pamela and I have a similar audience, right? So she comes to my things and she comments thoughtfully. Wonderful. It's good for me, but it's also good for her, her visibility. So it's a good thing to, to thoughtful comments, uh, and also one-on-one -on -one connections with your, um, with your fans, as many of them as you can. 
uh, one on one conversations to get to know what really are their wants and needs. What have they been buying? And this is something I do at least once a month, even though I'm already quite clear about what my people want. I do at least one market research conversation per month with a super fan, with someone who has bought at least one of my products. I say, hey, it's you this month or it's you this. I try to do one every week if I can, but usually once a month. What am I trying to, what am I asking them during that time? Hey, um, what are you buying? And so this is really, I, I, wanna, I wanna spend a little bit of time on this. Okay, so, okay, market research conversations, right? Sorry for the misspelling, <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, what are they spending money on regarding, uh, related to your type of topic or product, okay? Um, this is really, really important. I want, you to, I want you to understand this very clearly. What is your market? Do you know what your market is? Your market is the spending of your audience. That's what your market is. Okay. Meaning your income, the money that gets into your bank account, where does that money come from? Come from the sky? Comes from law of attraction? No. The money that goes into your bank account came from the spending, the purchases of your audience. That's where the money comes from. So your market is literally the budget of your audience. <laughs> okay. So, so for example, I mean, I'm going to use me and you because we can use this example here. My market is literally your budget. Like where do you, if you spent a thousand dollars, 2000, 3000 this month, where did those $3,000 go? Okay, went to electricity, went to water, garbage, right? Netflix, you know, whatever you, food, you know, but you also probably spent money on some training, some courses, some coaching, some, some kind of services. Where did that money go? Or maybe in the last three months or a year, where did, where did you spend money on training and coaching? That's where my money, that's where my market is. If I can direct some of your spending to my product and services, that's effective marketing. You see what I mean? So that's why I'm always asking you in these market research conversations, hey, Wendy, hey, Elizabeth, hey, Pamela, where did you spend money uh, recently on my type of thing? Oh, you bought from that person. Well, isn't that interesting? Oh, why did you buy that product? Oh, you bought it for that reason. Oh, well, maybe I should, you know, and thinking within myself, oh, maybe I should frame my product and service more like that because she just spent money there. Do you see what I mean? This is why I do at least one of these conversations, one-on-one -one conversations every month. Where, where are you spending your money? Not, not please tell me, you know, show me your entire budget. No, I'm not, where are you spending money in my area, in my area of expertise, right? That's what I want to know. So I want you to do those kinds of conversations with your fans and your clients too. You see what I mean? Because if you can direct more of that spending towards your business, then you're doing effective marketing. You're doing, and marketing isn't just about where should I post? How often? What should I say when I post? That's not really, mar that's really like the later stages of marketing. A lot of you are forgetting the beginner stages of marketing. The most important stages of marketing is what should you even create based on your market, based on their spending, what therefore should you create or curate? You don't always have to create products and services for people to buy. You can curate. You can find, oh, you're, you're, you're spending money on that? Oh, well, I don't want to create that, but it's, I can find someone who's selling it and sell it to you for a commission. So let's say I was, um, let's say that someone said, Hey, I want to buy your, uh, I want to, I, I, I'm, yes, I'm spending money on how to, um, create better visuals for my website. Now that's not one of my strengths. I have a pretty good visual eye, but I can't teach that stuff. So later this year, I'm collaborating with one of my, it happens to be one of my clients. She's going to create the course. I will sell it for a commission to all of you. So you see, I don't always have to create and curate product and services that my clients want, my, my, my audience wants. So what about you? Do you understand enough where the money is going from your audience members? And therefore, what should you create or curate? That is the beginning of marketing. 
Because if you don't create or curate what people want or what people spend money on, you can shout at them all day long, have the best copywriting, have the best graphic design, have the best website, and still nobody will buy. Nobody will buy because people only buy what they want. People only buy what they buy, not what you want them to buy. I, I have said this for years and I can't say it enough. I will say this for the rest of my life probably because, none, because we keep, especially all of us here, our visionaries, heart-based business owners, we tend to be very much in our own vision. We're in our own passion. So we're like, I'm so passionate about this. So therefore, if I hire someone like George or, or Pamela or somebody else who's good at marketing, I should make them, I should be able to, or a copywriter or a graphic designer, I should be able to make people want to buy my thing, right? Actually, yes, in the very long term, you can educate them about wanting this thing, but you educate them through your content, right? Over time. I have said about, I've talked about Facebook ads until I'm blue in the face for years. And some people finally came around to it. It's like, okay, fine. I, I believe you, George. You've educated me for years on the importance of Facebook ads. Now I'll finally buy your course. That happens too. But that takes years of education and content. But if you want to make money and, and be able to have a business that's viable <clears throat> in the next three months, right? You need to sell what people want, what your people want. Of course, that means enough reach, right? collaborations, Facebook ads, all that stuff. What do your people want? Curate, cur create, or if you don't have time to create, curate and take a commission. Hey, you, you seem to have a really good course on that. Can I sell it? Because my people want this. Great, can I take 50%? It's a do-it-yourself course. If you, if you sell someone else's course, and if it's do-it-yourself, meaning it doesn't matter if a thousand people buy it or 10 people buy it, it doesn't cost the course creator any more effort, you need to take 50%. That's the typical commission share online courses. If, if you're selling someone else's service and they can't take that many people because every time someone buys, they have to put effort in, then you can't take 50%. You might take 10% or 15%, maybe up to 25% if, if it's somehow doable for them. But you can curate. That's how you can make money fast by selling what people want, but taking a commission for it. But that means you have some kind of audience. Maybe you have a network of people. An audience doesn't mean that you have to have run Facebook ads. Maybe you have a bunch of friends. Maybe you already have a bunch of Facebook friends who listen to you. Then that's your audience for now, right? So I hope this is helpful. And um, so, all right. Yeah, and Holly, thank you. Holly says, maybe the Facebook course isn't doing well this year because of the limited budget. Yeah, I, I did up the Facebook course price by three times in 2020. That was a mistake. It was $100 2019 and suddenly it's $300 this year. Well, it's because I added a bunch of stuff. I added the, the Facebook group. I added the bunch of calls. So I thought it was worth 300. I still think it's worth 300. But yes, it's the other thing is your audience is used to a certain price point. And then if you jump it too quickly, that's going to put them out of their price range. So lesson learned. Um, but yes, that's, that's, you know, I'm still learning, right? I'm still, and some of these lessons I've learned for 10 years and I'm still learning them. So it's okay to be a slow learner. <laughs> you just have to keep doing it. Just have to keep learning. And every year you learn a little bit, something, a little bit, something, and it'll just keep getting better every year. So yes, thank you for that. Okay. Let's keep going. Yeah. To the next question, which is Alona. Great. Alona says webinar, Facebook live, zoom, YouTube, Instagram live. <laughs> the last one I know anything about. What are the pros and cons of the various options? I have made a number of YouTube videos over the years and only a few Facebook lives. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, and let me just, you know, kind of uh, zoom in a little bit here. When you say webinar, it should not be lumped into these things because a webinar is a method. A webinar is essentially an online interactive video. It's a video online where people can interact with you either through chat or through voice. That's what a webinar is. And so you might even say some Instagram lives are actually quote unquote webinars. So webinars is a web seminar. And it, so it's a very vague term and it means a lot of different things, but I'm just gonna call it an online interactive video, okay? And Zoom should not be lumped into these things because Zoom is a software that's usable for you know, online meetings and webinars. So <laughs> webinars are a method, Zoom is software. And now we're going to talk about the platforms, the places where you can share 
your webinar, okay, and your online content, right? So Facebook Live video um, uh, has more reach um, in the short term, okay? So the thing I like about Facebook Live video is that what, what uh, and let me just um, kind of look you in the eyes. So Facebook Live video can be done in two places, well, really three places. On your Facebook profile, which is your Facebook friends, your family and friends, you could do Facebook Live video there. On your Facebook business page, which for some of you, are, you're just starting a Facebook business page, or maybe it's crickets, right? Not, not very many people interacting with you. That's okay, you could start your Facebook Live videos on your profile if you feel it's appropriate for all your friends and family to see it, okay? For a lot of us, we don't want that, so we do Facebook Live video on our business page, okay? And, um, and then the third place you can do Facebook Live video is in a Facebook group. And so if it's your own group or if, if it's appropriate for someone else's group, you know. But um, Facebook Live video has more reach in the short term compared to, face, uh, compared to YouTube, okay? And uh, probably compared to Instagram. Instagram, you probably have a smaller audience there than you do on Facebook, especially for your Facebook profile. So I would say more reach, in, meaning more engagement, meaning you'll get more encouraged because more reach means that you'll get more likes, you'll get more comments, it encourages you. And it's very important when we're thinking about which content platform to use. It's not just about reach, it's also about our own encouragement. Because if you're feeling encouraged about it, you're more likely to keep going. And that's what I want, that's what you want. Consistency and longevity is as important as which platform you choose. Because the consistency and longevity is what makes you excellent. It what's, it's what allows you to practice communication again and again and again and to test different topics again and again and again until you, you know what people want you to say and you become better at saying it. So that's why consistency and longevity is as important as a decision factor for what should I choose. So like I said, Facebook Live is good for encouragement, especially if you do it among supportive people and it better, more reach in the short term. And also it's good as I said here, for <clears throat> less perfection, right? When you make a video on your own, you're like, oh, let me start over. <laughs> Second take, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Third take, and you keep taking, doing multiple, multiple, multiple takes. When you do a Facebook Live video, you know you have one take. Now, of course, after you finish doing your Facebook Live video, you can take it off if it really, really was terrible. I usually keep it on anyway. I usually keep it published anyway, but you can take it off if you want to. But Facebook Live video is good for less perfection and therefore more practice, right? Therefore more practice, more practice, which is always good. More practice is always good. Okay, YouTube, as long as it's encouraging to you, right? If it's discouraging, I don't want that, right? Um, YouTube is much, much better for longer, re longer term reach. Like I already said, my Zoom YouTube video, my, not just Zoom, many of my YouTube videos Suddenly, three years, five years later, sometimes just one year later, suddenly gets a lot more views and more than more views over the years than, than the Facebook Live got. Facebook Live will get you your first couple hundred short term views in the first month or first week, really, a couple hundred views. But YouTube will get you a couple hundred or even a couple of thousand views over the years because YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world. People Google for answers, and after Google, they go to YouTube for answers. That's the second largest search engine in the world is YouTube, after Google, and of course, Google owns YouTube. So, YouTube videos, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do a Facebook Live video or a Facebook video, you might as well also upload it to YouTube for longevity of views, okay? So, um, okay, and then Instagram. Instagram is good, and yes, I, I, ca I caught, glanced at some of you asking for Instagram course. Yes, I will be teaching an Instagram course later this year. Instagram, Instagram ads, it's going to be part of one course. So look for that later in the year. Um, so Instagram Live, and you could get started now to kind of get some practice, get some muscles going. Instagram Live is, is, is good if you have a bit of an Instagram audience. Most of you don't have much of an audience on Instagram, so it's not going to be very encouraging if you go live there. It's going to be discouraging because nobody saw it, right? So I would say probably Facebook Live is better at this stage for most of you. But Instagram Live, if you do Instagram Live, after you finish doing the live, you click end video, 
make sure you click on the download button on the upper left of the Instagram Live. You click end, and then you'll see that there's a download button on the upper left. That's your one chance to download the video to your camera roll, otherwise it disappears. It's very scary. But after you end the live video, look for that download icon, click on it, and then click share to story, bottom left, and then uh, bottom center, top left, download, bottom center, share to story, and then I go the extra step of clicking on the, go to my profile, click on the plus button, and then upload it as an IGTV video. I know this is all jargon for those of you who don't know Instagram, but um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Okay. Let's keep going. We're doing, I think, pretty good on time. <clears throat> Let me see, how many more do we have here? I just want to check. Oh, we might be able to finish. We'll, we'll see what, how much we can go. Um, okay. Alona says, I have heard you suggest charging a little when inviting to a webinar. Is that the only reason that people are more likely to show up? Or do you have other reasons? Okay, so uh, just to clarify things, there are really two models I recommend for webinars, okay? Free to attend, charge for recording, okay? Um, why do I have three bullet points here? Let me see. So free to attend, charge for recording means this. You're going to teach something, and wouldn't you rather have people actually consume what you're teaching because how many times have you signed up for a webinar saying, oh, I can't be there. I'm gonna download the recording. I'll watch it later. And you never watch it. Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you before. Probably everybody here, even those who didn't raise their hands. All of us have had the good intention of downloading a webinar to view later and we never do it. It's not because we're lazy. It's not because we're just, no, it's just everybody does this, okay? Because we, we, it looks so good. And we'd rather have it and not have it, the recording. But most of us don't watch most of the recordings we download or we have the intention to. So what is better for your business is for people to actually get you, get the experience of you, which means they either watch the recording, which like I said, is a minority of the people who have the intention. So you would rather have people attend live because then you know that they were there. You know that they experienced you. Otherwise, you don't know how many people, yes, you know how many people downloaded the recording. Maybe you have metrics for downloads, but how many people watched the download? You don't know, no idea. And did they watch for two seconds, 10, 10 minutes, or the whole thing? You don't know. So the only reliable way to know if people are experiencing you is that they're there for the live webinar. All right, so the model is, I recommend, is free to attend paid recording. And uh, I'm going to give you a link, which I will put in the comments below, where I taught this. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm just making sure that I can find it for you here. Um, okay, yes, I found it. All right, so this is a, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you real quick on the screen. This is an interview. Like I said, remember I said collaborations? Well, Mark Silver, is one of my favorite collaborators with me. I'm so grateful for his you know, mutual support. And he interviewed me about this model of free to attend, but paid recording webinar model. And he thought it was really interesting too. And just tell you, Mark Silver has even more business experience than me. He is really like one of the mentors in my field that I look up to. So I'm really grateful that Mark has given his uh, stamp of approval to this model. So I will be sure to give you the link uh, in the notes of the video and also uh, in, the, uh, in the Zoom chat. You can go and look at this and watch this uh, interview. He interviewed me about this and I, I interviewed him about something else, so we, we traded interviews. So that's what I would recommend, free to attend, live charge recording. This will make sure more people are there experiencing you. And of course you can, for the last 10% of the webinar, you can talk about your services or your whatever. And then later you can have that webinar as a product that you can sell. So make sure it's a webinar that you're proud to sell later, okay? All right, the second model is paid to attend or recording and sold evergreen afterwards. What do I mean by this? This is how I do all my courses, right? I'm teaching a course, I record it live, I have people there so it's more interesting, and then I charge for the recording or I charge for people to attend live also and for the recording. But this is really only doable if you have a big enough audience. 
if you, well, big enough is a relative because maybe even now, if you, if you sold an online course, you recorded it live and, and sold it later, you might even have two people attend and maybe that's okay, right? So, but the larger your audience, the more interesting the live attendance for the paid, the, the paid course is. So anyway, um, second model. And then the third, <laughs> the third uh, bullet point I had here Okay, the third is if your audience is big enough, you can occasionally do a public free Q&A, just like the, what, what I'm doing here. If your audience isn't big enough, if you try doing, hey everyone, I'm gonna do a public free thing. Okay, so, so this is the, disa <laughs> the disaster a lot of people experience. I'm doing a, a free webinar. You can sign up for my free webinar, or, and if you sign up, you'll get the recording. Guess what happens? You might get some signups, you might get 20 people to sign up and two people will attend live. And then the other 18 people have the intention of watching the recording and maybe one or two of them will. It will be quite discouraging. Maybe that's not, maybe, maybe that's okay for you. That's maybe a good practice, but just know that those are the kinds of numbers you're going to have. You're going to have about 10 to 30% at best live attendance for a free webinar that has a free recording. And then, Everyone else will have the intention of watching it and very few will. So just so you know, you need a big enough audience for this kind of thing, right? Look, I have, and just to give you a perspective here, right now I have 25 of you joining me for this live webinar. How many, how much of an audience do I have? How many people got this announcement? Just so you, over 6,000 people on my Facebook page got this announcement and I'm just going to, in my email is let's over 6,000 people got this announcement. 25 of you are here live. Let's do the numbers here. It's 25 divided by 6,000. That's less than one half of 1% live attendance. Just so you know what's going on. Okay. Now I have to say, okay, actually 100 people, about, about a hundred people said on my Facebook event, yes, I'm interested. So, um, 25% attendance is actually quite good if for 100% people, uh, 100 people saying yes, so 25 people. So that's not, that's really good, but I have a, I have a very warm audience, and um, so that's, that's also why that, that's the case. Okay, so Anna says, I would like to hear about Facebook ads 101. <laughs> okay, and maybe we will end with this, and then the other one, um, the other questions I will, I will answer in the next uh, in the next free one, okay? So I would like to hear about Facebook Ads 101, and I will give you um, just a few slides from my course. I wanna thank uh, Lucas Forstmeyer, um, and I'm going to, uh, just gonna show you his, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you the recording, uh, the, the few of the drawings first. So he, he went through my Facebook course uh, as a student and just decided to put these together because he really learns better visually. So he thought this was helpful, and I thought this was helpful too. And maybe it'll, you'll find this more interesting to, to, to look at than just my uh, uh, than, than just my face. Okay. Um, so here are the ever sorry here are the evergreen principles I consider for face for effective Facebook marketing. Right. What do we do? Okay. So first we have to understand, and this is straight from my course, and he's just kind of summarizing it. Facebook wants to do the following. They want to reward helpful, caring interaction. That's what Facebook, you know, we all think Facebook is, you know, evil, monster, they want to take our data. No, no, no. What do they want? Here's what they want. Facebook wants more attention, more people showing up to Facebook. That's what Facebook wants because it's good for us advertisers. It's good for Facebook making money on people like me paying money to Facebook to advertise. So how does Facebook get more people paying attention to Facebook? They want helpful, caring interaction. That's what makes us show up again and again and again. So Facebook is rewarding that in the algorithm, okay? Secondly, Facebook is trying to frustrate the spammers and engagement baiting. What is engagement baiting? Engagement baiting is, hey everyone, what's your favorite color? Comment below, is it red or white? Hey everyone, comment below with one word. How are you feeling right now? That's engagement baiting, which means it's really not thoughtful interaction. It's maybe a little bit fun, but it's, it's really just the person who is doing that is trying to get more visibility in a kind of a spammy type of way, okay? So Facebook is trying to frustrate that. They're trying to shut those down. They're trying to do less of that in the algorithm. Yes, sometimes it does pop up, but they're, they're, they're always trying to, to de decrease that 
and reward help for a caring interaction because they notice that that's what makes people show up to Facebook again and again and again. So therefore, what should we do? Care more than people are, are used to being cared for on Facebook, which is, like I said, thoughtful comments, reaching out to people one-to-one, -one, uh, commenting on their stuff, but also reaching out one-to-one, -one, have conversations. That's what people, Facebook wants. Have meaningful interactions. Create inspiring content in your voice because your voice is unique. By definition, your voice is unique. Not just your speaking voice, but your writing voice, your, your, your photo photographic eye. Your voice is unique, so create more content that's inspiring to your audience, but from your voice. Be authentic, encourage real comments from your audience. Okay, what do we not want to do? Try to hack the system, because Facebook is always one step ahead of the hackers and spammers, they, or maybe one step behind, but they will always catch up and, and, and suspend pages, decrease that stuff in the algorithm, trick people into comment for reach, like I already said that. Chase the latest trend. If it works, it will work in the long run. So don't freak out. Oh, Facebook, every time you see people go, hey, Facebook has a new algorithm change, please do this, please do that. Relax. It's not sustainable for us to chase those things. It gets on, it's, it's not good for anxiety. It's bad for burnout. And if it works on Facebook, it will work for the long term. So let me give you an example. Facebook stories, just like Instagram stories. You've all seen them. It's the things that show up at the top and it's like really ephemeral content. That stuff goes away at 24 hours. That was a new feature, what, two or three years ago, and I ignored it. I'm like, I don't care about Facebook's new features because they constantly introduce new algorithm changes, new features, and then they go away. Most of them go away. Sustainable and, and not anxiety, non-anxiety marketing means to relax when everyone's freaking out about a new feature. Relax. If it's going to be good, it's going to be around. So I ignored Facebook stories for a couple years. I'm like, well, let's see if it's sustainable. Indeed it is. So now I'm using Facebook stories too in the simplest way possible. Do you see what I mean? That's, that's what works in the long term. And I'm quite successful on Facebook marketing compared to most, most of my peers, right? So what do we do on Facebook ads? So that's what the person wanted to say. And let me just, um, let me do, uh, okay. Okay. So this is the general, my general strategy about Facebook ads. Step one, advertise to a, actually not step one, two. I mean, some of you don't have a warm audience, so you start with a cold audience. But these are, these are basically two parallel branches of my Facebook ad strategy. You advertise to a warm audience, people who have interacted with your content in the past year, whether they visited your website, Facebook knows that because you installed the Facebook pixel, or they're on your email list, Facebook knows that because you uploaded your email list to your Facebook ad account. And Facebook will anonymize them. Facebook will not spam them at all. Facebook will only allow you to run ads to your email list. Okay, So your warm audience is either people who have inter interacted on your Facebook page in some way or on your website or on some list you uploaded. Okay, What do you advertise your warm audience? You advertise, first of all, I would say this first, text and video content, 40% of your monthly budget. So text and video content, text only posts and video posts. You can see them. When you go to my Facebook, uh, when you go to my Facebook um, business page, you'll see this is the kind of stuff that I post on Facebook: text only and videos. Right? This is my video going on right now. Um, oh, and thank you, Tom, for your comments here. Um, text only, right? This is a text only post. I like advertising stuff like this, and um, I also do videos. Right, this is an interview, right? But videos, right? Videos. So. Um, Whoops, are we back here? 40% of the monthly budget, and then, um, 40, sorry, 40% of the, yeah, 40% of the total monthly budget, and then invitations, 20% of monthly budget, more during a launch, but 20% usually. Calls to action, hey, do you want to buy this? Do you want to sign up for my coaching? Do you want to join my group program? Whatever you're inviting, okay? To your warm audience, that's what you use Facebook ads for, these two things. To your cold audience, people who have never interacted with you, Okay, you do 40% of your monthly budget text only ads. Like I showed you, this type of stuff where it's just words, no images. You could put a link if you want, but remove the link preview so there's no images. Why is that? Why do I recommend text only ads to cold audiences? Because any images is too easy to click like, especially people who don't know you. They're surfing. Oh, nice mounted, nice flower. Nice lion, nice person's picture, 
like. They never even read it. But you don't know if they've read it or not. You don't know. A lot of people click. And what happens when people click like is that they automatically get roped into your warm audience under Facebook ads. And now you have a bigger warm audience spend of people who never even read your stuff. So my cold audience rule for Facebook ads is try to blend in. Don't stand out. You don't want to be standing out to people who don't know you. You want to blend in. And only the people who see a few lines, if those few lines are relevant to them, the particular activation system in their brain will catch that and go, ooh, I want to read more because that's relevant. That's just a few lines is relevant to me. You want, first of all, you want readers in your audience. You want people who, are, who care enough about your topic to actually want to read the two, 300, 500 words that you wrote, text only, no, no images. So this is why my Facebook ad strategy is quite different than just about everyone else you can learn from because everyone else talks in terms of funnels. I get it. They talk in terms of funnels and they say, get lead generation, get traffic ads to an opt-in page, maybe a video that gets people to an opt-in page and then you know, advertise to people who watch that video, your low price offer. Et I get that. I get that. I get the funnel. But usually what happens is they build a really large and irrelevant warm audience which means their budget gets bigger and bigger over time, but not more, not more uh, effective. So that's why I say inspiring, helpful content to your cold audience, text only, to the warm audience, video, really. I do video to my warm audience and then invitations to buy stuff. So like I said, if you want to learn the full strategy from me with all the nuances of how to find the right cold audience and, and, and especially higher income, cool audiences that are good for your products and services, I teach all that in my Facebook ads course. And also I teach the whole nuances of how to do the warm audience ads, all that stuff with many years of testing, uh, $25,000 of my personal ad spend over the past few years. Um, I've run over a thousand campaigns by this point. I just looked at the numbers and I'm like, Oh, over a thousand campaigns. Cool. So, um, anyway, uh, I hope this is helpful. <laughs> I finished up the, uh, thank you all for staying uh, over the hour and I hope to see you in the next free uh, group public q and I, I, Again, during this global crisis, I'll probably do this once a month. And, but those of you who have bought any of my courses, I just want to show you real quick. Um, again, this is a, pre, a public free thing. So I'm modeling what I'm teaching. The last few minutes at least, I should have taken 10%, which is you know, six minutes, but I'll, I'll, take, I'll take two minutes. Maybe I did uh, that part of my Facebook ads uh, selling was, was part of my, my 10% time. But um, if you go to georgecow.com, and you go to services and you click on workshops, okay? Just buy any of these. You know, if you wanna start off with something low price, this is only, I think this is $50. Let me see here, it's 50 bucks. Yeah, 50 US dollars. And this is a very resource rich course. You will have a planning template annual, my business model uh, annual planning template. Uh, week, week by week progress tracking sheet of the most important metrics for a solopreneur business. This is really, a, I, I think, honestly, a very valuable course. And it's a very good price at this, what you get. So if you buy this, okay, you will get two months of my bonus Q&A calls, okay? Um, bonus Q&A is kind of like what I'm doing here, is I answer questions from students who have submitted questions in advance. But it does require that you, you know, buy something within the past two months, and then you can schedule, uh, uh, you know, your joining that. So, so buy any of my courses. If you haven't done the intro course, you probably should start there. Um, but any of my courses will get you two months of these kinds of Q and A calls, and plus, if I do any free ones, you can of course come to those as well. So, I hope this is helpful. Thank you again for being part of my audience. Honestly, I'm I'm very honored and grateful that you chose to you know, be with me today, you chose to watch this. Um, if you have any comments and questions, I'm always very uh, inviting of those below. So thank you again. I'll see you in some video or some call. Bye for now, thank you.